Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Essary. I'm an associate professor here at Wake Forest University. Uh, welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, the IMC is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, uh, sponsored by Wake Forest University and previously sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. Uh, this week, the IMC hosts a roundtable discussion on gender citations and the political methodology community. This discussion is motivated uh, actually by a lot of papers, but most prominently by a paper recently published in Political Analysis, uh, Gendered Citation Patterns Across Political Science and Social Science Methodology Fields. Uh, this was co-authored by uh, Michelle Dion and Sarah Mitchell, who are here with us today, and also Jane Lawrence Sumner, uh, who is here in spirit. Um, we're pleased to host uh, 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 five panelists, and, uh, and plus myself. Uh, the panelists are uh, Michelle Dion. You can wave when I introduce you. <laughs> Associate Professor of Political Science at McMaster and uh, co-author of the paper in Political Analysis. Uh, Sarah Mitchell, uh, who is F. Wendell Miller Professor of Political Science at the University of Iowa and a co-author of the paper in Political Analysis. Uh, Dave A.M. Peterson, Professor of Political Science at Iowa State and author of uh, Author, Gender, and Editorial Outcomes at Political Behavior, uh, which was a recent, uh, which was a contribution to a recent PS symposium on how gender influences editing and reviewer decisions at major journals. Uh, and finally, uh, Barbara Walter, Professor of Political Science at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego, and a co-author of The Gender Citation Gap in International Relations, uh, a paper in International Organization. Uh, and then there's me. Uh, I, I already said who I am, and I co-authored a response to the Dion Sumner and Mitchell paper for political analysis. I co-authored that with my graduate student, Kristen Bryant, uh, entitled, uh, Are Papers Written by Women Authors Cited Less Frequently? Uh, each member of the roundtable uh, will take uh, six or eight minutes to make a brief presentation, uh, after which we will take questions from the audience. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of the webinar window. And you can ask a question at any time. Uh, we'll get it right away, but I'm going to try to hold uh, all the questions except for clarifying questions to the very end. So go ahead and ask a question whenever you want, but just know that it's going to be held to the end. All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the IMC. Thanks for agreeing to be here. Uh, we're going to go in order uh, uh, previously agreed. Uh, Sarah, you're going to go first. And did you want to go ahead and share your slides? Yeah, sure. Great. Okay, so um, my interest in this topic, uh, I guess, goes back many years. Um, I've been uh, trying to promote uh, various aspects of women in the academy. And um, one of the things uh, that we noticed over the years in talking about uh, gender issues in the academy, uh, I think my interest in citations came about when we would see newspaper stories uh, and there would be a you know, discussion about how deterrence theory helps us understand an international situation. And inevitably, a lot of those news stories would be an interview with, say, four or five individuals, and they would all be men. Uh, and then women scholars in international relations would say, like, where are the women in these discussions? And, um, and so when I was chair of the ISA Status of Women Committee, I proposed putting together a panel on the issue of citation, the citation gender gap um, and I had seen something that Dan Maloniak had posted uh, using data from the TRIP survey, um, kind of looking at some of the gendered aspects of the data that, that the TRIP project had collected. And so uh, I recruited uh, he and Ryan Powers. Uh, that, that paper became the paper that Barb's involved with and it's published in IO. Uh, and then we also had a special issue that was published in International Studies Perspectives, um, which uh, talked about a lot of the, the various issues around this topic. Um, so the basic question obviously is, is research by women cited less frequently than research by men in the same field? Um, there was some work by um, a economist who uh, looked at different areas of economics and found, for example, that women were cited more in labor economics and other areas of economics. Um, when she expanded, uh, this is uh, Marianne Ferber, but when she expanded her work to other disciplines, she observed a similar pattern where 
uh, women were more likely to cite the work of women than men in the same research field. Um, obviously, this is an important question because uh, citations are important uh, measures of scholarly impact for tenure and promotion decisions. Uh, journals use impact factor scores to evaluate their success and, and reach. Um, a lot of algorithms like Scholar Google are based on uh, you know, how often papers are cited. Um, and there's actually a study showing that citations can pay literally in terms of 50 to $1,300 uh, for each citation that your paper gets. Um, so in the paper that we presented on the ISA uh, panel, uh, we looked at um, the, we took two journals in ISA, uh, International Studies Quarterly and International Studies Perspectives. And then we took the articles that were published in 2005 and tracked the citations um, and broke them down by uh, using Ferber's design, which was to, to match the, the sex of the authors of an article and then match that to every bibliography entry and the sex of those uh, works that are of the authors of the works that are being cited. And you can see here an example for the ISQ results that we found that men, you know, women uh, were citing the work by women at a rate of, you know, three times higher, 33% versus 11%. And we saw a similar pattern in international uh, studies perspectives. Uh, Michelle Dion and I then expanded that uh, analysis to look at Journal of Conflict Resolution, Political Analysis, and a couple of other journals. And we presented that at uh, Peace Science a few years ago. Uh, and then that some of those uh, analyses became the foundation for the paper that we worked on with Jane Sumner that was recently published this summer. Um, so why why is there a citation gender gap? Um, and one of the things that Barb and her co-authors talk about is maybe that women don't cite themselves. Um, Michelle's going to talk about this question because we've we've actually done some analyses uh, looking at this recently as well. Um, maybe women's work is less visible in fields where they're a minority of the larger group. And one of the things that our political analysis paper does is try to see whether a critical mass of women in a field matters. Uh, and unfortunately, we find that even in gender and politics publications, uh, there's still a gender gap in terms of men in those subfields uh, citing work by women less often than female scholars. Um, we could uh, look at some of the work that's been done on syllabi. Um, for example, Jeff Colgan's analyzed um, IR syllabi and found that women are less represented in uh, course syllabi. And so this can translate again into uh, fewer citations as if that's the foundational literature that people are learning. Um, there's contagion effects um, from looking at other people's references. So if there are implicit biases and citations, those can tend to be replicated uh, when people are looking at other, other scholar citations. Um, there's also been work showing that women historically have been less represented in edited volumes. Um, and those are the kind of networking uh, places, right, where uh, people's work is becomes visible and known in, in a field. And so if there are gender processes uh, in either edited volumes or publishing more broadly, those can uh, have ripple effects for citations. Um, OK, so what are some of the things we can do about this? I think a lot of the published studies uh, have been really successful in raising awareness and getting people to talk about this issue. I feel really optimistic about this uh, because I've seen a lot of positive changes and discussions with people uh, in the last couple of years. So I, I think the, uh, what we're trying to do is working in terms of at least getting people to think about citations. Um, there was someone on the PSR that said, OK, if this exists, then what am I supposed to do about it? Um, and we used that quote in, the, in a recent paper that Michelle and I wrote. Uh, we can obviously uh, think about uh, diversity in our course syllabi. Uh, Jane Sumner has a great tool that she's developed where you can copy the references from your, you know, from a course syllabi or from a paper, and then it will calculate the percentage of women authors. And so you can check really quickly uh, what, what kind of gender balance you have in your work and in your syllabi. Um, you can also, uh, obviously, as female scholars, it's important to promote your work, um, to blog about it, post, on, post your work on social media. Uh, there are you know, uh, groups on Twitter, like Women Also Know Stuff, that are doing a really good job of of promoting the work of women and getting, and now actually media, people in the media, right, can go to these sites and find lots of women experts, which is great. Um, and then the last thing that our paper shows, I think, is that uh, 
as more women enter a field, uh, there may still be a gender gap in citations, but it gets smaller. So uh, obviously recruiting more women in political science is, is a goal that we should all continue to promote. I couldn't hear you before, Justin. Oh, Did you I, think, I think I accidentally muted myself and then talked and then unmuted myself. Okay. Good hosting. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for four years now. Anyway, uh, Michelle, go ahead and share your screen and, and, okay. uh, and share your slides. Okay. Try again. Uh, we see the notes. I know. I did that before. Swap displays, maybe? There we go. There we go, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pick up a little bit um, where uh, Sarah left off um, and just kind of remind everyone of the results from the PA article. So this is the figure that shows that um, female authors are more likely than uh, male and mixed gender team authors to cite work by women, even in fields like uh, politics and gender where women um, are the majority of authors. And um, another way to... Uh, see this is to look at the predicted probability of citing a female on only reference. And um, so on the left is um, the predicted probabilities for political analysis if you have a male, female, or mixed gender team compared to politics and gender. And so what this really emphasizes or makes stark is that if you have more um, women in a field, you will have more women in the reference list overall, but there still is that gap in how people are, um, who people are citing and whether or not uh, men, mixed gender teams or women are citing women. Um, you still see that women are more likely to cite work by women. So that's kind of our, um, our, PA, our key PA results. And um, there was a lot of discussion about it this summer, which is a little bit exciting. Um, it did make uh, an appearance on uh, poli-sci rumors. Um, this is the quote, which you know basically is someone saying like, I don't wanna, I, I don't really care, like what, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to use this information? How many women should I be citing? Is there some standard proportion? Um, or is it more nuanced? And so in response to this, um, Sarah and I, uh, collected and looked at data for 38 political science journals. Um, and basically, uh, you're probably not going to be able to see the details here very well, but the idea is we went through um, all the APSA sections and um, took the most recent section membership data and calculated the proportion of section members that um, self-identify as female. And then we took the authors of articles in the journals sponsored by those sections, as well as the journals um, by kind of the regional um, associations like NPSA, Southern Political Science Association, their journals as well. And if we were able to get their membership um, gender distribution, we included that. And so what you see in this figure is for 38 journals, the proportion of members of the sponsoring organization is the black dot with 95% confidence interval. And then, uh, no, that's for the journal, my apologies. So the black dot is the proportion of authors that are female in that journal over a 10 year period. And then the gray is um, the section membership, the proportion of membership in that organization or section that are female. And so I think the key takeaway from this um, and our and Sarah and I's motivation in presenting it is to say that, you know, there is, there, there is some data here that suggests that, yeah, women are concentrated in some fields and less concentrated in others. And so, you know, shooting for 50% female authors might not be reasonable across all fields. We would suggest that these are useful baselines or minimums that people should be thinking about when they're considering their course outlines, their syllabi, their reference lists for their uh, published articles. I think the other useful thing that this um, figure and analysis makes clear is that in almost every instance, 
um, women are a higher proportion of members of an organization than the um, authors publishing in that journal in recent period. So that kind of opens up this question of why are women members of organizations but not publishing in those journals sponsored by those organizations? Are women self-selecting or are they not getting into the journals if they do submit? And so I think that's something that uh, requires additional research going forward. But we would suggest that this is at least a useful starting place and a more nuanced way to think about what are the minimums that we should be trying to um, include uh, in terms of the proportion of women in our syllabi reading list citations. And then as Sarah mentioned, we've also um, looked at self citations because um, there is a suggestion in the literature that uh, part of the reason there's a gender citation gap is that women are less likely to cite their own work. And so um, in this analysis, we have uh, 13 different journals and 10 years of data. And essentially we were controlling for things like the, um, the cohort of the most senior author, the number of citations of the most senior author, kind of the average number of references in that journal or even the number of references in that article. And then we look at the composition of the author teams. And what um, the figure on the right shows is kind of a collection of these results. The first, I guess it is seven coefficients um, or odds ratios depicted there are for the characteristics of the author teams and um, the probability that, uh, or the, the probability that they're gonna have um, a self citation or if it's one of the models that has counts, it's um, for the count of their self citations in a particular article. And so what that's, what these results suggest is that if we're looking at kind of uh, solo women and solo men, solo male authors are the reference category. For instance, there's not any real difference um, in the probability or the likelihood that someone is gonna cite themselves. But when you have uh, all female or all male teams, you're more likely to get self citations than if you say have a mixed gender team or some other combination of author orders as well. Um, so this is kind of trying to get at one of the possible explanations of the gender citation gap. And so. Um, I think it suggests that people <laughs> feel more comfortable self-citing <laughs> with people of similar uh, or the same gender. And then uh, Sarah and I and Jane also had a hackathon team at the APSA um, hackathon for inclusivity and diversity. And so I just wanted to throw up here since it'll be recorded and people can go look later. They can look at the um, results of our particular team's effort. We included in um, our team's results a, a fairly extensive list of recommendations for different roles. So we have recommendations and ideas that um, our team came up with for what can editors do to address um, citation gaps in, uh, with regard to gender? What can peer reviewers do? What can people who write letters for uh, tenure and promotion do? Um, we also often in those recommendations uh, mention Jane's uh, tool, which Sarah also mentioned. So there's a link to her tool if you haven't found it um, on your own already. And then uh, one of the other uh, products of our hackathon team was also a sample kind of assignment that you can include in a graduate seminar that uh, our team thought would help uh, prompt people to independently think about um, who they initially think to look to as um, leaders in their particular research fields, and then to kind of reflect on whether or not they initially come up with a um, gender balanced list of names, and then if not, to go back and kind of run it. <clears throat> and I'm gonna try to figure out how to turn off the stop share. Excellent, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dave, you wanna go ahead? Sure, um, so I came at this uh, uh, as an editor. So I'm editor of political behavior and uh, the inspiration really for paying attention directly to the, to the role of, of gender in the publication process um, comes from David Samuels and Ben Ansel and their work as editors of CPS. Uh, so they started uh, doing an internal audit of the review process at CPS, looking at editorial outcomes uh, based on the, the gender of the authors. And David shared the work publicly. And so I saw that and thought, well, that's, that's interesting and that's incredibly important and something I should try at political behavior. 
Um, and then David and Nadia Brown organized a symposium at APSA, which turned into the symposium at PS that, that Justin talked about. Um, if you, if you, unlike me, if you don't read PS cover to cover, you might not have noticed uh, that it is in the most recent issue. Um, for those of you who still get paper journals. Um, but the, it was a set of editors from a range of journals. So APSR, CPS, ISQ, world politics, and political behavior. Um, we all followed the same process of identifying the gender of authors, categorizing them as uh, solo uh, with a male author, solo with a female author, and if they're co-authored, was it uh, all male team and all female team or a mixed team? Um, and while all of us basically find an effect for writing together, co-authored work tends to be much more likely to get uh, accepted at all of our journals. None of us were able to find any systematic biases based on gender. Um, so that the probability of having a manuscript accepted out of any of these journals um, is the same for solo authored uh, um, men writing by themselves, women writing by themselves, uh, all female teams, all male teams, or mixed gender teams. Um, the, the teams are all the same and the solo author work is all the same. Um, we also coded the, the, what came out, what the uh, reviewers themselves suggested, not the open-ended comments because that's really, really hard, but the sort of qualitative rankings. Um, and there was no systematic difference in that either. And so it doesn't look like uh, reviewers are making different recommendations based upon all of us, I believe, were blind, uh, double blind journals. Um, I think that's true, uh, uh, or at least double blind. CPS is triple blind. Um, but there were no differences on the reviews, and there were no differences on the editorial decisions given the reviews. Um, so we've tried to account for that as well. Um, and so, as an editor, um, it's nice to see, it's, it's relieving to see that the process doesn't seem to be, uh, doesn't seem to have. Um, bias at that stage. Um, and, and so that's, like I said, that's, that's quite relieving. I also, uh, like Justin, uh, was one of the people who wrote a response in PA to the paper by Sarah, Michelle, and Jane. Um, and I know I didn't tell Justin I was going to do this, but I am going to uh, flop up a figure if I can get this to work. Let's go to that one. If I can embiggen it. So, oh, wait, that's the wrong button. Uh, I'll just do that. So uh, Sarah, uh, uh, Michelle and Jane did share their data with me, which was quite helpful. And, and I've tried to think about um, as, as an editor and as an author and as, as a teacher, the gender biases in the work that I cite and the work that I assign. And I'm somebody who studies American political behavior. And in thinking about this, I've been stuck in, in trying to implement some of these changes because you know, there's some foundational work in political behavior that gets cited a lot. And to a certain extent, they're almost throwaway sites. But if you cite uh, the American voter, if you cite uh, voting, if you cite uh, Downs, or if you cite VOK or Schatzneider, you know, these sites were written in the 50s or 60s. Uh, these, these books were all written uh, back then in a different discipline. And so one of the things I was struggling with was um, how much of the gender disparity do, that we see <clears throat> based on the era of the work that we're referring to. So I took um, Michelle, Jane, and Sarah's data and broke their citations down by decade. So it's the citation to something by decade. And this is the one graph. They all look pretty similar. But this is for all of the, uh, all of the journals in their, in their data in the PA piece. Um, and the take home point is that we're getting better, um, that a lot of the disparity in citations, um, or at least the biggest disparity in citations are not surprisingly citations from things written in the 60s and earlier. Um, and that it's not really until we're starting to cite work in the 90s where the gap from that green line uh, really, really starts to shrink. Um, which leads me to think a little bit more about what's the appropriate standard, which I guess makes me think like somebody posting to PSRM. Um, but what is the, the right standard for this? And I'm not sure the current um, rates of publication are, are the right standard. But I think that's true for two reasons. One, I think, is some of this 
the historical legacy of the gender disparity in the discipline means we're going to have some leftover uh, uh, some leftover citation differences. Let's see if I can, how can I, how do I undo that? I want to get back to not showing my screen. Uh, <clears throat> the share screen button at the bottom should work. Or yeah, unshare. See the bottom. Well, huh. well, you're just going to see that picture for a minute still. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the the other thing that 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 concerns me about the literature is that it is sort of the other side of this, which is there's an implicit assumption in the work that the quality of work published by men and women is equal. And I think there's a growing amount of evidence that that might not actually be the case. So the survey work that my colleague Amy Erica Smith here at Iowa State and her two co-authors are doing show that there are different rates of submission. Um, you know, amongst political scientists, and that uh, men are seemingly less risk averse when it comes to publishing, that men are much more likely to take a shotgun approach and just keep submitting lots and lots of papers that might very well be of lower quality. If the papers being submitted are of lower quality and they're being accepted at the same rate, the uh, math sort of implies that uh, the publications themselves may not be of equal quality, right? So if, if women are submitting better work but are getting accepted at the same rate, the published work by women may very well be better than the published work by men. Um, I don't know what to do with that. I don't, I don't know what to think about that. I don't know how to measure that. Um, you know, if we, if, you know, we, we can't obviously use something like citations because if there are gender biases in the citation rates, just because something's being cited at different rates, that even if there's parity in the citation rates, that doesn't that doesn't help us. So that's something I'm trying to puzzle out, and I don't know what to do with. But it's something I wanted to take this platform as an opportunity to sort of raise. Um, I think I'll I'll stop with that and try to figure out how to get my camera back. On. <laughs> All right, uh, Barbara, we can still see you, so go ahead while Dave figures out how to unshare his screen. Great, great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start by telling a story. Um, the the really strong finding that um, we published in our article on gender cite, the gender citation gap was a mistake. Um, Daniel Maliniak was playing around with the trip data and um, he was really interested in trying to figure out um, what was correlated with citation counts. Um, and he put in um, 26 different factors that he thought could possibly matter. So everything he, he thought could be important. Um, Gender was included, but he, it didn't occur to him that this might be significant. And then he started running the analyses and gender was not only significant, but he couldn't get rid of it no matter what he did. Um, and he came to me and he showed me this and he said, what do you make of this? And I was not surprised at all. <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, well, you know, that kind of confirms um, not only what I suspected, but it's starting to confirm um, what we're seeing in terms of all sorts of things related to, to gender. Um, and so um, we, he, we wrote that up together with Ryan Powers at Wisconsin and they did a network analysis to see if this also um, was the case when you looked at more seminal articles. So if you look um, at the really important articles over the years, oh, and I should say that, that the, um, our universe of cases was all articles published from 1980 until 2006. So these were relatively recent articles. We didn't go back to the 1960s. Um, it was since 1980 and it included 3000 articles. Um, and when you looked at the seminal articles in that time period, um, most of the big uh, nodes were written by men um, and most of the articles that those seminal articles cited were also written about men. Um, and we actually, had, when you looked at the raw data, there were some really important articles um, by women that, that you know, ended up being in, in the periphery um, that, that were not surprisingly not as well cited as you would have thought they would be. Um, so those were our two main findings. And then the question was, why do we think this is the case? Um, and we had two hypotheses. One was um, that women cited themselves less and as, as Michelle um, and Sarah just pointed out, they do, that's true. 
Um, and then the second theory that we had was it had something to do with what we thought might be these informal cabals where um, graduate student friends or junior faculty friends or subfield buddies um, make a pact where um, they just agree to cite each other more. And since more of the discipline is dominated by, by men, um, that was gonna disproportionately um, benefit men. We have no evidence that this, this is actually happening besides anecdotal evidence, um, but it's one possible, possible theory. Then when we thought about um, what, what are some things that young scholars can take from this? What are our recommendations to them? And of course, the first recommendation is, is to cite yourselves more. Um, and when we started saying this, um, we got a little bit of pushback and the pushback was disproportionately for, from women. It was really interesting to see the response. Most men said, well, of course you cite yourself, doesn't everybody? And the women said, really? I didn't know that the people were doing that. Um, and then the women would follow up and say that they felt uncomfortable doing it, um, that they thought there might, they might be viewed negatively if they did that. They thought there might be some, um, some um, censure about that. And, and it turns out there isn't. Um, and James Fowler and a co-author did a study of Norwegian scientists. Um, and in that field, self-citation was absolutely rampant. It was, it was kind of laughable, actually. Um, and they looked to see if the people who were the most egregious self-citers, if, if there was any negative effect to it. And not only did they find there was no negative effect, um, but they found that for every time a, a scholar cited their own work, they got an addition, almost an additional four sites um, over the, uh, the time period. So, um, so there was actually a very big benefit um, to citing yourself beyond simply adding um, additional citations because um, uh, you got these, these secondary citation, citations as well. So that was one of the ways we thought that um, women could, could begin to narrow this gap um, and then it's, you know, it's n networking, um, you know, people cite people who they know and, um, and getting involved in that network is going to, to handle. I want to end um, just by touching on something that Dave said, which I thought was really important. And I'm really glad that editors of major journals are, are taking this up. Um, I, I sit on the board of international organization and, and a couple of years ago, I gave a presentation um, on uh, the research that we have showing various types of implicit and explicit bias. Um, and, and I talked about how this might creep into the review process at an academic journal. Um, and John Peavy House was the editor at the time and he took this really seriously and he collected a whole bunch of da data like Dave did um, with IO's process. So one of the things that I brought up was um, um, the possibility that bias creeps in at the editor's desk. Because most um, review processes are, are double blind at best, that means that the editors, when they receive submissions, know the gender of, of the author. And if they have an implicit bias, um, then women could be hurt as very early in the process. Um, and so I suggested if this is the case, going to a triple blind submission process. Um, uh, you know, their bias could also come in in terms of the review process. So the two big areas that John Peavy House looked into was, was the editor's desk and then the, the reviewers themselves. And he found two really interesting things. He found that, that um, um, women, there was no difference by gender in, to, in terms of who was desk rejected, um, which is good. But he did find um, a difference in terms of, of, well, not necessarily the review process. He also found that there was no difference in terms of rejection rates, R and Rs, and acceptance acceptance rates by the reviewers and the editorial board by gender. What he did find was that there was a big difference in submissions. Well, actually, there was a difference in terms of acceptances. Um, 
women were far less likely to submit to IO than men were. But if they did submit, they were more likely to be accepted. And so this sort of supports the theory that women are, you could think of them as either more risk averse, perhaps more perfectionist, but that they are, when they are submitting, um, uh, they're submitting an article that is more likely to be accepted. One theory could be it's because it's higher quality. Another theory could be, you know, who knows, maybe there's, there's a reverse bias, who knows. But women are submitting less to IO. If they do submit, they are getting accepted more. So I think it's fantastic how much research has been done on this, uh, on various gender biases. I think all of this is really important to know. There's also a lot, a lot of areas where we, we still don't know what's going on and we certainly don't know why it's going on. And so um, this issue is definitely, you know, not resolved yet. All right, uh, thanks. Um, I'll just say uh, really briefly, because I want to get to Q&A, um, that uh, the, the thing that I did with uh, my co-author, Kristen Bryant, was to take the Dion, Sumner, and Mitchell data set and, in, and instead of using the reference lists of those papers as the dependent variable, we looked at the citations to the papers in that data set as the dependent variable. And uh, if you, I'm going to combine, we did a follow-up thing on, in political, uh, the political methodologist, so I'll just sort of combine both of those analyses here. If you just put all the, uh, all the papers with uh, a, a female author in one pile and all the papers with no female authors in another pile, uh, the pile with female authors is cited less. So the raw numbers bear that out. Once you control for the journal they're publishing in, though, uh, that goes away. And in fact, um, the female authored papers at the same journal are cited more. And then when you control for author count, which is to say the number of people who are on the paper, co-authors on the paper, then the effect becomes zero. So um, what this suggests uh, to, to me, and I, I think to Kristen as well, is that um, at least this, these were only modern papers. So these were papers that in the Dion uh, uh, Sumner and Mitchell data set, I think only went back uh, 10 years, I want to say. Um, uh, holding all else equal, uh, the paper was treated fairly in terms of being cited by other authors. Uh, but the question it raises is uh, obviously uh, in, in observational data, most things aren't equal. People are choosing to go into different fields. They're choosing to submit to different journals. They're choosing to co-author or not. And uh, the, the question that I think is outstanding is why the, there seem to be differences in those choices across gender. In other words, why are women more or less likely to submit to certain journals? or to be accepted there, and then why are women more or less likely to co-author? Um, because co-authoring was a, was a big variable that was important. Okay, so uh, we have 20 minutes uh, remaining for questions. Uh, I just wanna thank everyone for, for that presentation. Uh, the round table is available to take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar window. And uh, I will uh, uh, get started uh, by asking a few questions that I've uh, prepared. So um, I guess the, the first thing I want to know is uh, on, on the citation research, um, one question I have is how do people choose, like what theories do we have or do we have any theories about who, dis, who gets cited, right? Like why, why a paper chooses to, or why, why when you're writing a paper, you choose to cite it. And I know for my own, in my own personal workflow, how I choose it's sort of a haphazard combination of papers I've seen in conferences, papers that turn up in Google, <laughs> papers that are in the bibliography references of the papers that I've already read. Uh, I would never imagine thinking to myself, oh, this paper is written by so-and-so, so I'm not going to cite that because I don't like so-and-so or I don't know them or whatever. But it could, it could be a knock-on effect because I don't know certain kinds of people and so I don't know about their papers or, or something like that. So I'm wondering what the sort of, at a broader level, what you think the the sort of theory of how citations get generated is. Can I start? Yeah, go ahead. 
So one of the things that surprised me when I became a faculty member and I started reading um, dissertations, graduate student dissertations, um, was that even though they just come out of two years of coursework, even though they just had comprehensive exams where they supposedly had read all of the literature in their subfield, so they, they it was it was it should have been at at the at their fingertips. I was just shocked at how often they just cited people in the department. It was as if it was as if the only people doing citable work were UCSD professors. <laughs> and and at first I thought, well, you know, they're being sycophants, right? They're, you know, they know that we're going to write letters for them, and they're kissing our ass. But I I think it's more. I just think even if people are familiar with the literature when they're writing they're going to you know the thing that is most top of top of mind and then they're interacting with faculty members that are giving them suggestions to things that are top of mind and of course the first thing that everybody thinks about when they read somebody who's doing work similar to theirs is well why aren't i being cited more so it just seems that there's there's this cycle of familiarity um and and because we're all time constrained you, you know we're, we're we're taking various shortcuts and that just leads to this sort of phenomenon can, can i jump in yeah, there go ahead um, i think that the those explanations are are likely but there's also work by um people in science and technology studies that like look at these practices and i really like the work by bruno latour in science in action on this issue of, of citations so he's looking at kind of uh, people in the natural sciences but he does i think um a very good job of talking about and looking at different ways of citing work right so we kind of implicitly know this but he makes it explicit that there's, um, like Dave was mentioning, there's the citation to the grandfather, usually, of an idea that's kind of the obligatory, you know, citation from the 1950s um, or, or earlier. But then there's also the citation where you're doing it to kind of um, argue with someone or pick a fight with someone and that there are like subtle ways that we undermine um, certain of our citations and bolster citations. And one of the one of his key arguments um, is that m a lot of our citations that we have in our papers are actually us kind of um, arming ourselves with a team, uh, a backup. Right. So like if you want to pick a fight with me about my argument, you got to pick a fight with these guys behind me who are backing me up, who I'm um, using to kind of back up the legitimacy of my argument and my evidence. And you can imagine, he doesn't talk about gender explicitly, but you can imagine if you're trying to kind of make your team um, of citations and, and your team of people that are gonna back you up in, in the construction of your argument as strong as possible, there are probably some implicit biases going on where you think like, I'm gonna pick the most senior most dominant, most male kind of authority to help back up my argument. And so um, no one I, that, to my knowledge, has kind of incorporated gender into kind of the type of logic he uses to explain our citation practices. But um, I think, you know, if we buy the argument that some of our citations are to um, lend authority to our own arguments, then it's not surprising that we would try at least implicitly, or we would be kind of trying to appeal to um, senior men in the discipline. And I think just as a footnote, there's a, an interesting debate going on in the Chronicle of Higher Ed right now about are citations political and are we citing people because they're very senior or because we're making these conscious decisions. And in that um, debate, it's more about what should we do with um, harassers and people who behave badly? Should we be citing them or should we um, ignore their work? But there's there's clearly a kind of a debate about whether or not citations are political and there's some people that claim that they aren't and then there are other people that say of course they are and um, we should be kind of thinking about those politics of citations i think there there are definitely implicit and explicit reasons for um, why you get uh, citation cartels so yeah the on the explicit side i mean there's lots of different layers of this right <clears throat> women 
there's a leaky pipeline in the profession. So women get represented at lower percentages at, as we move from student to PhD um, and all the way up to full professor. Um, we also know that women are underrepresented at research one institutions uh, relative to other types of institutions. So there's also a layer rate of a lower representation of women at the universities that are producing research. And there was just a study in computer science that showed that articles uh, that are published out of elite institutions have more influence in terms of citations. Um, so that's another layer, right? That if elite institutions have fewer women in them um, and those articles are the ones that become central, uh, then that can like build in another explicit part of that um, citation cartels. I think the implicit side of it is much more dangerous. Uh, the, when I was editor, uh, associate editor of foreign policy analysis for two months, I assigned reviewers to articles and then realized I had not assigned a single female reviewer. And I walked back through every article I had done this for, and I just realized like this was implicit bias, right? Like I think of who's writing on this topic, diversionary theory, and my first 10 people that I think of are all men. Um, and that's even though I think about gender issues all the time, I try to combat implicit bias. Um, but I think I think that's the more pernicious side of of these processes. So so if we have any implicit biases in the way that we think about what's the most important work in the field, then those are the ones that we really have to work hard to combat. And um, I found the same patterns in my recommendation letters. Uh, I looked at my recommendation letters for all of my students uh, and found the same gender biases that are described in the Trix and Pasenka article uh, that I had more negative adjectives. I talked, you know, talked about their, um, you know, the ways that they kind of started slow but improved themselves. Um, and again, like I was horrified. I, I don't want to be writing negative letters for women. Uh, so I think the, the implicit side of it is something that we have to work really hard to like self-evaluate what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I, you know, one thing that strikes me, the, the combination of the findings, so the from the symposium that Dave was a part of in PS, um, it appears as though for the most part, uh, women authored papers are not treated differently, uh, but they submit a lot less. And that raises uh, the question uh, of, of why they're submitting less. Um, and Barbara mentioned it might just be risk aversion, right? Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if we have any evidence about whether equal quality papers are treated equally. And what I mean by that is there, there are these famous studies where um, you, you send a CV uh, to, a, to a scientist to evaluate for like a postdoc position, and all you change about it randomly is the name at the top of the CV. It's, you know, like Jane Lawrence or John Lawrence, something like that. And uh, even women scientists evaluate the, 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 the CV with the woman name as being worse with an identical record. And unfortunately, in the observational data, you know, everything's, everything's you know, sort of per selection biases are pervasive. And so I wonder if we have any evidence about whether pap papers that are of equal quality actually get treated equally, because uh, if they're not, that would possibly explain why women are, are less are more reluctant to, to submit. Um, we see that in the CV. We also see it in like women choosing to run for Congress, right? You, they win at similar rates, but they also we know the selection process for women is a lot more rigorous than it is for for men. So I'm wondering if there's any evidence about that and, and what we know about that. Uh, we cite a paper that was done in communication studies, and they they took all abstracts submitted to their national convention, and then they had grad students uh, from different institutions code the quality, the scientific quality of the abstracts, and they randomized the abstracts to to authors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they took all. It would be like you have all the abstracts submitted to APSA, and then you just randomize, you know, the whether it was male, female, or mixed gender, and they found that yes, men and women grad students rated. Uh, the scientific quality of the abstracts lower if there was a female author on the team. So, so I think that's that's probably one of the best studies I've seen that that shows the kind of implicit biases that I'm talking about, because that that shouldn't exist, right? Because the 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 assignment of gender was completely randomized. Mm -hmm. And I get, one place. Go ahead, Dave. No, I mean the 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 if there were systematic across journal differences. 
the journals that have gone to triple blind or the journal that I know of that's gone to triple blind, we might be able to see some of this evidence, right? So uh, like I said, CPS is triple blind uh, at, and, and there doesn't seem to be any women don't you know if 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 this argument was right we would expect uh women authored papers to do better in the process than um if there was some kind of implicit bias offsetting some kind of quality difference um and my memory of the results from from cps is that there wasn't a difference and so they i mean we all found nothing and so uh even though we had some pretty drastically different editorial processes I mean, one of the, so one of the that brings up a, a related point. So at this at this time, uh, the major subfield journals in political methodology are all single blind. Uh, political analysis just shift, shifted to a single blind uh, system under the new editor Jeff Gill, um, and uh, PSRM has been single blind, I, I believe, uh, since the beginning. Um, that, that's my recollection, at least. Uh, and so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that's something we should, based on what we know, something we should be concerned about, something we shouldn't be concerned about as it relates to uh, the representation of, of uh, female authored articles in political methodology. Well, in the ISP special issue, there was an article uh, that looked at uh, Journal of Peace Research because they switched from single blind to double blind. And um, at least for that journal, they did not find um, a significant shift in terms of the probability that, of women's acceptance. Um, so, but then, right, this is a Scandinavian context. So, <laughs> I get, like, it's kind of hard to say, right? Like, um, is the context for political analysis going to look look like that? But at least the JPR results would suggest that um, the particular single blind versus double blind might not produce a dramatic differences in terms of um, who's accepted. I would actually be more concerned not with the uh, bias in the editorial process because I think at least the editor and associate editors can be conscious of that. I would be more concerned about a potential chilling effect on submissions um, that, uh, you know, given that we know from various studies that women are less likely to submit to certain high prestige journals. Um, I would be more concerned that women would be less likely to submit to PA given the single blind. So that's, I would watch that and um, pay closer attention to that potentially, because that's something that the editorial board and the editors and the reviewers can't really control, but could be um, an unintended consequence. Uh, one thing that Jeff claimed uh, when he made the switch is that essentially we already uh, reviewers already knew uh, because it's a relatively tight knit community, and I have to say that in my own personal experience, that isn't true. Uh, the times I thought I knew who I was reviewing, I was wrong. I can think of one specific, uh, very salient instance where I was ninety percent sure I knew who it was, and it wasn't that person. Um, uh, so I, his justification was sort of, well, it's already effectively single blind, so we might as well just dispense with the the pretense that it's uh that it's double blind and um so one thing i wonder about is for jpr and for other especially subfield journals whether the double blinding is actually effective because everyone's presenting their papers uh at conferences and it's sort of you know it, it makes the double it makes e, uh, a nominally double blind system imperfect in ways that might actually you don't see the shift as dramatically as you would if it truly were double blind. Um, I'm not sure how to get get. I'm not sure how to uh, account for that because we're not going to stop people from presenting papers. I assume uh, or going to conferences. But I think it, what it does is it removes that option from some authors because I know that there are some people that um, that I can think of that are at um, elite institutions that you know are more likely to post the working papers and tweet out the working papers and clearly have no kind of worries about people finding out that they're the author if a reviewer goes and Googles the paper title. And then I know other people that um, are cagier about it, right? They are more careful about publishing the full version of the paper or they change the title to try to obscure um, their identity, presumably because they fear that if reviewers know it's them, they'll in some way be disadvantaged. So I think what the single blind um, does is it removes that kind of choice 
um, to the extent that authors have it um, at all, it, it removes that choice from their control. Um, we've got about uh, four or five minutes left, and I want to make sure to uh, to ask. Um, so uh, hopefully, the people, uh, some of the people who are watching are. Uh, junior career scholars um, who are trying to get ahead, trying to get a job or maybe to get tenure. And uh, part of getting tenure now, because it's easy to do, is to, you know, go to Google Scholar and see what their H index is or whatever it is that they're looking at and uh, the number of citations. And I'm wondering, uh, sort of, on, since we can't change the system, uh, at least not right now, uh, what can an individual person do to maximize their uh, their impact, given the constraints of the system we have, other than like go to Harvard or something, you know, like get a job at Harvard, which is like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> well, let me take up something that that Sarah had on one of her slides. Um, you know, I think promoting your work is really effective. Um, it's something that academics are not trained to do. Many academics aren't comfortable promoting their work, but but blogging, tweeting, using various um, social media to um, disseminate your work can be quite quite effective. I was really shocked when I started a blog back in in 2012. Um, how how much impact it ended up having and. Um, and I think if you're not at one of the elite universities or your your mentor isn't a really well-known academic, that there's now more ways than ever that you can actually circumvent some of these um, barriers to ent entry and go straight to your audience. Um, and so I would I would strongly encourage students just to to become, you know, familiar with with who the influencers are in your subfield on Twitter, for example, who has blogs that are really reaching an audience that you want to reach and and inject yourself in that um, conversation. It's not that hard to do. I would add to that um, that sometimes low tech is another option. So when I was um, an assistant professor, someone more senior than me actually took the time to send me a printed out copy of their article with a note. And, um, you know, sometimes now I get emails with links from people saying, here, check out my new paper. But, you know, I get lots of email. I don't get a lot of packages in my mailbox. And so um, I, my suggestion to um, some of my students and junior colleagues is, you know, if you have a paper that you really want certain uh, people to read, print it out write a little post-it handwritten note and invest in the dollar 50 of postage to actually snail mail it to that person because you might actually get them to take a closer look at it. And I would say the same thing with um, your book. If you are a book writer and you get a certain number of free or discounted books, buy books for the people you want to read your book and just send it to them um, with a little note. Uh, and I think you know that that can also be effective um, for kind of reaching people that are uh, in your field, but you know maybe aren't on Twitter uh, because they're more old school or something like that. So it's kind of a mix of, of strategies is probably a good idea. I'll add two things. Um, one is uh, nominate yourself for awards. Um, I've served on a number of award committees. Frequently, the number of nominations is something like three. Um, and so if we had one more, you'd have a 25% chance of winning basically. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't be afraid to self nominate. And if that feels a little icky, make a pact with someone to nominate each other for conference paper awards, for article awards, for, for all of those little things. And the second thing, which, um, to sort of, uh, follow up with something Barbara had said is don't just track your H index and your citations, but look at the, if you're going to be tweeting about it and if you're going to try to blog about it, um, uh, your work, track the alt metrics, metric statistics as well. Um, most journals now have next to the, the article itself will have a couple of numbers that the editor, or excuse me, the publisher is tracking how many times the paper's downloaded, how many times the paper's tweeted, how many times it's mentioned in the media. And so if you're, if you're doing that, 
take credit for it. And so when you're putting together your tenure and promotion file, talk about that as well, because that's a that's an, another metric. And we all know administrators love metrics. And if you're good at it, you know, you should you should use that. Michelle and I are starting a new project on studying alt metrics. So Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So we've collected the data, but it has not yet. We'll been see what that looks like. Um, I would say, I mean, I still think oh, part of the maybe old school way of, of networking yourself, um, like my work on the democratic piece got a lot more attention when Bruce Russett cited it. So, um, I mean, yeah, it is the case that if you can get people that are central nodes in the citation network to be familiar with your work, um, that can go a long way uh, to getting a, a diffusion of citations. So, so make sure that you're networking both horizontally and vertically in the discipline so that you're, you know, maximizing right the the opportunities that you have for people to be familiar with what you're working on. We're we're out of time, but a, a question came in from the audience, and I just want to very briefly engage it because I'd hate to leave that uh, leave that unanswered. Um, can the gender of the author be inferred even in a double or triple blind review process from the paper? So the idea here is, uh, do women and men have different writing styles so that even if the paper is equal and even if the paper is blinded, you could still tell something about the gender and then either explicitly or implicitly uh, make some judgment on that basis. Do we know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I think we do. The, there's a paper by Molly Roberts and some other individuals that looks at, uh, they find that the the, the topics that women are writing on are different than some of the topics that, so women are more represented in human rights, for example, than um, other topics in international relations. They, I believe in that paper, they also looked at the vocabulary that's being used and they found that there were differences, um, some gender differences in terms of uh, language that's actually being used. Um, and I think they're, there, there is some work on this in terms of like referential cohesion, right? And um, gender differences and, and how people use language. So, so yeah, I think, I think there's a lot more that we could do on the language side of things um, to see, to kind of answer then, this question. In, in our study, we found that there were gender differences in terms of epistemology, in terms of topic, in terms of, of methods. Um, in terms of theoretical approach. So women, for example, were much more likely um, to be constructivist. Men were more likely to be realists. Women were more likely to um, have a post-positivist um, approach. Men more likely to have a positive, ap positivist approach. So there are definitely patterns in, in those sorts of things. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, some reviewers know this, right? That a constructivist paper is more likely to be written by a woman than not, for example. Uh, well, oh, did, anything else before? Okay, uh, we, we are out actually a little bit past time and I try to be very strict on this. Um, I want to announce uh, before we go, next week, uh, Friday, November 9th, we're scheduled to host Luke Keel, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, presenting a talk entitled An Overview of Geographic Regression Discontinuity Designs. Uh, please visit our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, for more details on Luke's presentation and future presentations of the IMC. I also want to note that this presentation, this week's presentation, will be uh, archived, uh, so you can share it with a colleague who may have missed it uh, or, or catch up, uh, watch the seat again for the first time. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being a part of the IMC this week. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very much. See you later. See you next time.